It's estimated that 125 million people worldwide have psoriasis, and around 150,000 more are being diagnosed every year. In plaque psoriasis, thickened red patches appear on the skin, covered with flaking silvery scales. But the question of why remains. Looking under the skin's surface, we notice three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Healthy skin continuously self-regenerates, pushing older skin cells to the outer surface for removal. But in plaque psoriasis, skin cells are overproduced and move to the outer surface of skin too quickly in a matter of days instead of weeks, building up as raised and scaly patches of inflamed skin. And even though psoriasis is considered a disease of the epidermis, it starts well below the skin's visible surface. Psoriasis is an autoimmune and genetic disease, which begins when an abnormally triggered immune system reacts inappropriately to the skin, causing the epidermis to rev up its production of skin cells, creating more than what is necessary. By doing this, the immune system creates an ongoing cycle of inflammation and rapid skin growth, which we see during outbreaks as thickened red and flaking plaques surrounded by completely normal skin. Psoriatic flare-ups can last for months and are commonly triggered by injury to the skin, as with a bug bite, scratch, or sunburn. So keeping a trigger journal is highly recommended because if triggers can be identified, they can be avoided. Now to calm or reduce the risk of flare-ups, take proper care of your skin. Use a daily body moisturizer or emollients like petroleum jelly. Take daily lukewarm baths with mild soaps and salts and use the skincare regimen prescribed by your doctor. Living with psoriasis is stressful and that alone can trigger flare-ups. So managing stress with exercise, meditation and rest may be helpful. There's no cure for psoriasis and no single treatment is going to be effective for everyone, but it is manageable. Working closely with your doctor is the key to managing psoriasis. Mild to moderate psoriasis may respond well to topical gels or creams and ultraviolet phototherapy, while those with severe or resistant psoriasis may benefit from systemic treatments like oral medications and injections that offer relief throughout the body. If you've got questions about psoriasis, talk with your dermatologist about creating the best plan of action to putting psoriasis into remission and keeping it there. There's a lot we're still learning about the brain, but that shouldn't stop us from using what we do know to make it the healthiest, sharpest, most resilient version it can be. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. This is Discover You. I wasn't the type of kid who always dreamed of being a doctor. Far from it. But when my grandfather suffered a stroke, I found myself surrounded by doctors explaining to me what exactly had happened in his brain. Thankfully, my grandfather made a full recovery, but I was hooked. The experience became my launch pad for becoming a brain surgeon. I needed to understand all I could about this powerful organ, how it shapes and sorts our quality of life, how it defines and designs our every thought and move and memory. First, it should be no surprise given how complex the brain is that the recommendations for any given individual's brain health will be equally diverse. But I do know this, there is a best way to care for your brain. There is a best way to live, to move, to eat, to sleep, to think, to engage with the world that is best for your brain. Exercise and movement are not just good for the heart, they're great for the brain. Try to move for at least 30 minutes several times a week in activities that get your heart and your brain pumping. I know that sounds obvious, but do you ever wonder why exercise helps so much? It pumps out a substance called BDNF, short for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. When you understand this, it's no wonder that exercise makes you feel different, feel better, calmer, more present, less stressed, and sharper almost right away. Best of all, the exercise doesn't need to be nearly as strenuous as you probably imagine. Just move more, move often. Don't find yourself sitting the majority of the day. Keep learning, discovering, and exploring. This doesn't necessarily mean just taking new classes or trying new puzzles, though those are both good ideas. Try to find activities that really stimulate your brain in new and different ways. One way I think about it, get outside your comfort zone a bit. The old adage, do something that scares you every day may also do wonders for your brain. Sleep, and consistent quality sleep cannot be overstated. And just to clear this up, 
There's no such thing as catching up on sleep after a hard week of work. I wish there were. Your brain needs rest to rinse and reset, and limiting that rest can have long-term negative impacts. What you eat matters. Several doctors and researchers, including myself, have a new mantra, if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. Be mindful of what you put into your body and how it makes you feel. I kept a food journal to see what really worked for me as my own personal brain food. Turns out, fermented foods are my secret weapon. Pickles, figure out yours. Socialize safely when and where you can, even if that's not in person as often. It's not just a romantic thought. Human connection is essential for the brain. We are social creatures. We owe our brain's powers to human connection. We are just scratching the surface when it comes to strategies to build a better brain. To best understand why these habits help, prevent memory loss, build resilience, keep your brain sharp, we're going to explore the inner workings of the brain. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta. See you next time for more Discover You. The brain is a large mass of nerve tissue and arguably the most complex organ in the body. It is what allows humans to process emotion and speech while also regulating behavior. Additionally, the brain controls both involuntary and voluntary actions throughout the body, including the vital functions of respiration and heart rate. White matter tissue contains nerve fibers, primarily made up of myelinated axons, that act similarly to bundles of insulated electrical wires, which carry messages from one part of the brain to another. Tracks are generally classified into three categories, or subgroups, projection, association, and commissural. And it is through these tracks that regions of the cerebral cortex are able to communicate with other parts of the brain, the spinal cord, and the brain stem. Originally defined in the early 1900s by the German anatomist Corbinian Broadman, the Broadman areas divide the cortex of the brain into different regions based on cytoarchitecture. Broadman studied the cell layers, looking at cell size, spacing, density, and structure from region to region, separating the brain into 52 different areas. Broadman's numbered areas are still widely used as a way to label and differentiate areas of the human brain. The brain has three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem, with many distinct and important areas within each of these sections. The cerebrum is the main portion of the brain and is divided into right and left hemispheres. It is responsible for higher order functioning. The cerebellum is responsible for voluntary movements like balance and coordination. The brain stem is responsible for regulating vital functions like heart rate and respiration. The skin is the body's largest organ and it's the one that we show off to the world. Forming a protective barrier, skin shields our bones and vital organs from injury, harmful chemicals, and germs. Now the skin is made up of three layers. The outer epidermis divides from the bottom up, its cells forming the surface of skin. The middle dermis nourishes the epidermis with its great supply of blood vessels and nerves, and the inner hypodermis cushions the body from trauma. When healthy, skin is strong and radiant, but just like any other organ, it can get sick. As many as seven and a half million Americans are living with psoriasis. It's a chronic condition in which skin cells are made faster than the body can shed them, piling up on the skin surface layer like cars on a congested highway. There are several types of psoriasis, but 80% of sufferers live with plaque psoriasis, where thickened and inflamed red patches or plaques appear on the skin covered with flaking silvery white scales. The more body surface area affected and the higher intensity of redness, thickness, and scaling, the worse the disease severity, ranging from mild to moderate to severe. Psoriasis is the most common autoimmune disease in the United States, but sufferers can easily confuse it with other skin conditions like eczema. But unlike eczema, which may blister and appear wet, psoriatic skin will typically look raised, more inflamed, and scaly. And even though both conditions can be extremely itchy, psoriasis can cause pain, burning, and stinging as if fire ants are constantly biting the skin. Plaques have well-defined edges and can be several inches in size, sometimes even merging together into larger patches, 
cracking and bleeding in the process. Outbreaks come and go in cycles and can be brought on in some by weather changes, infections, and certain medications. Once triggered, flare-ups may persist for weeks or months before subsiding or going into remission where all signs and symptoms of psoriasis disappear. And while the cause of psoriasis is not fully understood, we do know that a dysregulated immune system causes inflammation and an overproduction of skin cells. Plaque psoriasis can develop anywhere on the body, but most commonly affects visible areas like the scalp, knees, elbows, and lower back. And even though psoriasis is not contagious, its appearance can make even the most confident people self-conscious and affect their quality of life. But there is a way to take back control of your body from psoriasis. With medications and lifestyle changes, relief from psoriasis is possible. 